Well, good morning, church family. Overjoyed that you're here with us today to join us in this way, to worship the Lord, to be seeking him from wherever you are. I invite you to join us in prayer as we come before him right now. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that you reign and rule, that you are king over all. In the midst of these tumultuous times, Lord, you are the rock upon which we stand. You're the solid foundation upon which we build our lives. And we trust you, Lord. I thank you that you are in total control. And in you, we can put our hope and faith and trust. You are our rock. You are the bulwark, never failing. And as we sing these songs and praise your name, Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would encourage our hearts. I pray that you would do the work that you want to do in this and through this service. And as we hear your word today, Lord, that we receive it with joy because we know it's from you and it's given to us specifically today. We praise you, give you glory. In your name, amen. Mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark, never, ever failing. Let's put our trust in him. Let's worship him. Let's sing. A mighty fortress is our God.
Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord, he made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Lord, that's what we want to do. We want to ascribe all the glory to you. Lord, no matter how things may look on the earth, Lord, you reign. Lord, you are in control. Nothing happens without it first passing through you. And Lord, we thank you that in troubled times and in difficult times and in good times, Lord, we can come to you and we know that you were there. Lord, I especially pray for your presence to be with your people throughout this world today, especially, Lord, those who are being persecuted, who are suffering just because they love your name. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones in Afghanistan this week and the crime and all these things. Lord, we know that the day is coming when you're going to set everything right. Lord, I do pray that in that interim period that you would just give us more of yourself. Lord, that is what we need. That is the answer. Lord, we can't solve these dilemmas that have been going on since the beginning on our own. Lord, our times ought to remind us just how much we need you. And Lord, as we've been learning, just how willing you are to take care of our burdens, to strengthen us. And we praise you for that, Lord. We want to magnify your name. Lord, as your people, may we live in light of your victory, in light of your promises, in light of your truth, so that we will not be dismayed or discouraged or frightened by anything that may happen on this planet, because, Lord, you knew it all before it did. And we pray that you would use all these things, Lord, to further your purposes. And, Lord, we do say, come, Lord Jesus. We long for your return. But, Lord, may we have the strength and the fortitude to wait until that we either see you or you come. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Thanks for being with us. And uh, it's normal, 11 o'clock. We have the adult Sunday school. It's been going really well. Very powerful lessons. Also youth and Sunday school. Also, you should have gotten the daily bread in the mail. If you haven't received it yet, then shoot us an email. As you know, our phones have been down since this pandemic started. But good news, uh, we're having a new phone system installed, and actually we're putting in security cameras with all the violence and things being done against the church. Those are going to be done at the same, thing, time, same time soon, so you'll be able to reach us by phone. Also, Awana is underway, and you can go ahead and register for that. And uh, also, the leadership offering uh, is for the daily bread. So with that, let's just turn our hearts to the Lord again. Lord, I do thank you for your word. Lord, what a, what a precious gift. Lord, I'd pray that your word would just find rich, deep soil today. Lord, there's not a one of us that doesn't need to grow, that doesn't need to change, that doesn't need to know and love you more. And I just pray that you would work powerfully through your word, through your spirit in our hearts today, Lord, so that we may leave changed closer to you. And I praise you for, in advance for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you think the world would look any different if you could see it through the eyes of God? What about the people around you, especially those you struggle with? Might they look different? Is it possible that God sees current events and our present difficulties differently than we do? Do you think he has a different view of COVID and political and social unrest and such things? Now, last week I told you that I believe with all my heart, if you will seek God in his presence and ask him, he will open your eyes and let you see some of the ways that he's working. And we really need that. We need that all the time, but especially in these times, because our God reigns and he is not just sitting back. There are so many things. I get so many reports from around the world. Even last week I was hearing about how many people in Afghanistan had come to Christ in recent years. He's working, and we need him to, you know, we just, we need more of his understanding of life so that we can get ourselves out of the, the dumps and the quagmires. But, it, you know, as I was contemplating what I'd said to you last week, 
it really got me thinking. What does Jesus see that I don't see? I mean, can you imagine what it would be like to see as Jesus sees, to have his perspective on our present world and on life? You know, I'm I'm confident that what he sees is much different than what I typically see. But is that really what he desires? Is that really what he wants? And as I contemplated this question... I began to pray, and then I searched the word, and it became apparent that God not only wants to open my eyes, but I realized that I will never be all that he designed me to be, all he created me to be, all that he wants me to be, if I don't see things as he does. You know, saints, our God wants to reshape our understanding of reality, so we don't just rely on what we see in our natural eyes or react. It seems like Christians these days, we're always reacting instead of focusing where we need to. You know, he wants to open our eyes so we can see rightly. He wants us to see things from his perspective, you know, the way that he's defined reality. Now, you know, let me be clear. We can't see, we can't know everything that God knows. That's impossible. But there is so much that he is willing to show us, and there is so much that we can see. You've got to understand, living rightly, you know, really living for God is all about perspective. Specifically, it's about having God's perspective so that when we look at current events, when we look at relationships, when we look at our situations, we're looking at them in light of what God has revealed not our feelings, not our emotions. Now, so really what I'm talking about is learning to see as much as we can, as much as we're able, as God sees. So this morning we're going to look at a fascinating story in 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to just be up front with you. I had a completely different message planned. I was, thought we were going a different direction. But the Lord just impressed on me this, what I had said to you last week, that he really does want our eyes wide open so that we can see from his perspective. And I believe there is a great deal he wants to show each one of us. And so, why don't you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. We're going to look at a story we looked at a, a number of years ago. And let's just see what we can learn. We'll pick it up in verse 8. Now, the king of Aram was warring against Israel, so he'd gone to battle with them. And he counseled with his servants, saying, in such and such a place shall be my camp. So he was telling his officers and servants where he was going to put his military and, you know, base his operations. And the man of God, as you'll find out, that is Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, saying, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. Did you get the picture? The king of Aram is setting up his strategic battle placements, and the prophet is telling the king of Israel, yeah, don't go down there, avoid that, because there's an ambush. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him, so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. So this wasn't like happened one time and that was it, or it happened twice. Apparently this was somewhat of an ongoing thing. Now look at verse 11. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, who's betraying me? Who's telling our secrets? Who's giving up my plans? And one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. In other words, in the, in the most intimate area, the most intimate place in this king's life, he's like, He knows what goes on and what you're saying in there. And he tells the king of Israel. Amazing, amazing thing. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and take him. You know, I'm going after this guy. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan, which is a city. And he said, horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And so they kind of creep in and place where Elijah is. It's completely surrounded. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early, his servant, and I think it's Gehazi, had gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? You know, he sees this 
army all around the city with his eyes. It's, he's scared. So Elisha answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I suspect about that time Gehazi says, man, my master's been out in the sun too long. He's lost his mind. Because <laughs> the only people I can see are the soldiers for the king of Aram, right? Now look at verse 17. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You get the picture? So they're in this walled city. The king of Aram has put his army around it. And when the servant's eyes are opened, he sees the heavenly host and these chariots of fire, this incredible divine army encircling them. It's, it's a beautiful, amazing thing. And I have to think that, you know, it's just, it's just, wow, it's amazing. Now look at verse 18. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people with blindness, I pray. So God struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And then Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. And they brought them to Samaria, so to the capital of Israel. And when they'd come into Samaria, so now they've gone in, this army has gone inside the gates of this powerful Israeli city. And Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Imagine how shocked they were. And then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And Elisha answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those you've taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So feed them, water, send them home. So he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. And I just love this final part of this verse. And the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. I bet they didn't. Can you imagine how terrified they must have been? When you sort of step back, this story informs us, and this one might surprise you, but it tells us that one of the most unusual benefits we're given when we come into a personal relationship with the Lord is that he enables us to see ourselves and the world around us from his perspective. If we will allow him, he will let us see both ourselves and our current events and everything going on around. Look at verse 17 again. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, I have to think when that servant initially looked up that hill and saw all the soldiers and chariots, he thought, man, we're done. This is it. We are going to die today. See, let's, let's kind of break this down a little bit. His eyes, you know, his physical, natural eyes informed him that they were outgunned and undermanned. But once the Lord opened his eyes and allowed him to see things from God's perspective, he saw a totally different scene. He saw that instead of them being trapped by the army of Aram, Aram's army was trapped by the heavenly host and God's army. See, another way to say it is, he saw who was really in control despite appearances. And he began to see and understand reality as God defined it, so I have a very important question to ask you. Which view was accurate? Was what he saw in the natural with his fleshly eyes when he saw that army, was that accurate? Or was what happened when God opened his eyes to see spiritual realities and see this heavenly host, which of those was accurate? Well, I think we would have to say that both were accurate. I think both of those things were, were real and they're accurate, right? So that leads me to my next question. Okay, if they're both accurate, which one was more significant? Which one was more important? You understand where I'm trying to go with this? See, I think there's all kinds of things that you and I look at and see in the natural, and, and what we see may be accurate, except we're, seeing only, we're only seeing part of the picture. We're not seeing what God says about that event. We're not seeing what God says about that situation. 
Now, here's another really interesting thing I want to point out to you. In verse 17, Elisha did not pray and ask God to send his chariots of fire and the heavenly hosts. They were already there. But the servant was completely unaware of their presence until the Lord opened his eyes. Now, as I thought about this, I began to wonder, how often do I see dimly? How often do I rely on these tired and limited human eyes of mine rather than on the clear, all-seeing, all-knowing eyes of God? We saw a moment ago, the servant's initial you know, evaluation wasn't wrong. But again, he missed the best part, the most significant part. I think you and I do that all the time. I don't think we wait on God. We don't really listen to God. We just want to, as we saw a couple weeks ago, we just want to do our own thing. We want our own agenda. We want our will to be done, so we just sort of try to force it forward. But see, God wants us to see what he sees. And as we see here, and we're going to see in other places, what he sees is so much different. See, Brothers and sisters, we desperately need God's perspective and vision. We need to see what he sees. And I think that is so true today. Too many Christians are becoming activists of the wrong thing. They're pushing the wrong agenda. Our hope is not going to come through a political system or a person. That's not a change, by the way. Our hope is going to come from one source, The truth is going to come from one source. So I have to ask, because I brought this up last week. Have you asked God to open your eyes? Have you started to do that consistently? Maybe you've always done that. That's great. Then keep doing it. But have you asked God to open your eyes? And have you allowed God to open your eyes so that you can have his perspective about any given situation, really every area of life? I want to give you another example. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19, verse 37. Very familiar scene. We look at it every year on Palm Sunday. Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday. He's seated on the seat of a a donkey, just as had been prophesied. He's fulfilling prophecy after prophecy as he is entering the holy city. And for the first time, he's going to take the stage and reveal he is the Messiah, the promised one. And the people are just going bonkers. And they're throwing down palm branches and they're putting their robes and their coats and things like that in front of him, right? Now look at Luke 19, 37. And as soon as Jesus was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, because he's coming down the Mount of Olives into the holy city, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they'd seen, shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Now, you've got to understand, Jesus knew that he was going to die at the end of that week. We studied this in depth last year. He had a complete knowledge of what was happening and where all this was going to lead. He knew that all these people who were cheering, Hosanna, blessed is the one coming in the name of the Lord, would soon be jeering him and say, crucify him, crucify him. Now look at verse 41. And when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. You picture the scene, this incredible celebration of his followers. They're so excited, and suddenly Jesus stops. And and from the Mount of Olives, you're, you're directly across, actually, from the Golden Gate, from the temple. And when he he stops and he looks, and he began to cry. And then he said, verse 42, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. I think Jesus was saying, if only you would have let yourself see what God was showing. Because think about this. Jesus had been among them healing the sick, you know, feeding the 5,000, the 4,000, casting out demons. He was teaching them with authority and power, the likes of which they had never seen. 
They'd seen it. I mean, the truth, think about this. The truth was standing right in front of them. It's like Jesus says, but you've closed your eyes. You were unwilling to see beyond the physical. And as a result, now you can't see God's truth at all. And, and listen closely to what I'm about to say. This is very, very important and applies to us too. The reason that they were unable to see was not because they could not know the truth. It was because they would not know and accept the truth. The truth was standing right there. All the evidence of miracles, everything was there. But they would not know it. And again, I, and I thought, wow, how often do we encounter a truth of God in his word or the spirit is prompting us? You know, we know the truth, but we will not accept it or we will not submit ourselves and obey it. And so we remain in darkness, blind. You gotta understand, in order to live the life that God wants you to live, the life that Christ died so that you could live, the life that God calls all of his children to live, you must want to see things from his perspective. That's why we need to constantly be asking God to open ours. But see, I think many times we don't really want to, you know, it's kind of like that old ignorance is bliss. Be honest with you, I used to not watch a lot of news and stay up on too many current events, and I, I, I wished I was blind like that now. There's so many things I wished I didn't know. But I believe one of the primary reasons we fail to see things from God's perspective is that we have allowed things like the news media and social media, our culture, and the opinions and attitudes of other people, as well as our own prejudices and things and wants, to shape our perception of reality. You know what we've been learning? We end up making it all about ourselves. We want our will to be done. But God says that we must allow him and his word to define and shape our perception and understanding of reality. We must look to Christ and not ourselves or other people for the answers we so desperately need. Because again, we, we just have this tendency. We keep trying to make everything about ourselves instead of about God and what it is that he wants. And you need to understand, this will not happen automatically just because you're a Christian. Wish it were so, but it's not. It demands consistent discipline and exposure to God and his word. You've got to be regular. We've been talking about this over and over and over. We've got to be diligent. We've got to be committed and constant. It also requires a context of fellowship and encouragement in a community of like-minded believers, the body of Christ, that we're still part of, that we're still being. But bottom line, seeing the world from God's perspective, more likely than not, is going to demand a radical change in you and a willingness to adjust the views you may presently hold. And guess what? Those may be about political issues, or social issues, or religion. You've got to want to know what God says. You've got to want him to shape your understanding. And you also need to let, when things look real in the natural, to, to weigh in, let God weigh in and showing you whether that is reality or not. Not only that, it takes commitment. As we've been saying, you got to go all in. You know what else? It takes obedience. Listen to what Jesus warned us, you know. The way you know you love Jesus is you obey his commands. You don't keep making it about yourself. It's about him. It's hard work. I mean, there's days, you know, I'd rather just sleep a little bit longer than get up an hour and a half early to do devotions to spend that time. You know what else? It takes prayer and constant fellowship with God. I don't know a single relationship that can grow without deep, intimate communion and fellowship. Listen to this. A.W. Tozer said, it is only as we begin to focus our eyes upon God that the things of the Spirit will take shape before our inner eyes. Obedience to God's word brings an inward revelation of God it gives us acute perception 
enabling us to see God even as has been promised to the pure in heart. A new God consciousness will seize us and we shall begin to taste and hear and inwardly feel God who is our life and our all. There will be seen the constant shining of the true light which lighteth every person that comes into the world. More and more as our faculties grow sharper and more sure, God will become to us the great all and his presence the glory and wonder of our lives. I translate part of that to mean as it As we've been saying, he's my priority. The place I want to be more than anywhere else is with him. The reason in our prayer time, there's a lot of troubling things going on. I don't think I, with my limited understanding, I read Job and it reminds me, I I need to be careful what I say to God. But what I can pray for my brothers and sisters around the world and people who are suffering is not only for his will be be done, but the thing that I've learned is most important, his presence Because I know God is eager to give his presence to his people. And I know that when I've struggled, when I've been hurting, the thing that got me through, the most important thing was being in his presence. We need more of God, not more of our own thoughts and ideas. And that's what he's talking about. God has to be what we love most. Now, let me add to this. As you probably know, the Bible is full of stories about God opening people's eyes to see things that they couldn't see or understand on their own. I mean, think of the many times that Scripture tells us about how God broadened someone's perspective. First one that came to my mind, the disciples. They've grown up Jewish with all these prejudices and wrong ideas about God. They think God only loves Jews. And they've been taught this religion of works instead of it being about their hearts. And so Jesus basically has to help them unlearn everything that they've learned. But there's more. We looked at Moses a few weeks ago. Remember when God encountered Moses? Or Moses encountered God, I like to say it the other way, at the burning bush. Moses had a completely different understanding of reality and how God should work than God did. God saw Abraham leaving his homeland and going to a new place and becoming the father of a great nation. Abraham, on the other hand, didn't even see himself traveling. David saw himself as a shepherd. God saw him as the king of Israel. A few weeks ago, we learned that Gideon saw himself as the youngest and least significant member of the lowest tribe in Israel, the bottom of the bottom. And yet, remember, the angel greeted him by saying, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And he's looking around like, where's the warrior? But then remember, God says, I'm going to be with you. This is what I'm going to do. You're going to go deliver your people. Now, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Again, let me give you a little background. Jesus has taken the disciples away to this beautiful place. I've sat there and had lunch. This huge rock formation, it's the headwaters of the Jordan. They sort of just bubble out of this rock. It's in a place called Caesarea Antioch. And they're there, and Jesus says, guys, who do the people say that I am? And some say, oh, some think you're Elisha, reincarnated, some think this, some think that. And then he says, okay, now he's going to make it personal, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah. You remember what Jesus said to him? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because... Only God could have revealed to you. The Holy Spirit had to open your eyes to know that truth. You're blessed. It was probably one of the high points of Peter's life so far, right? But boy, did he not stay up there long. Look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now picture what's going on. Here is Christ sitting with his disciples. Peter has just been committed, but after he hears this, look at verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. That phrase right there, think about this. Peter is rebuking our Lord. God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man." Again, let's just try to picture this. If Peter would have had God's perspective on the death and resurrection of Jesus, 
How might that have changed this conversation? Because other than his denial of Jesus, this had to be the worst moment in his life. To be rebuked, to be compared to Satan and told to get away. I can tell you one thing I know for sure. It would have been far less painful had he not said that. And a lot less embarrassing and humiliating, right? I mean, think about it. If he would have believed and said, okay, Jesus, I'm so sorry. It grieves my heart so much that you're going to have to die for the world. But I praise you, Lord. And I worship you, Lord, and I'm just so grateful. And give me the strength to just stay right by your side and hang in there with you to the end. What about you? Can you remember a time when your perspective was different than God's? For example, have you struggled to love someone that God wants you to love? Do you forgive the people that he wants you to forgive? See, friends, we need to see things differently. We desperately need God's perspective on every element of our lives, from the way we see ourselves to the way we see God and the world around us. You know, once I got off the ground from the initial shock of some of the events we went through, I realized, Lord, I need your wisdom. I need to see COVID-19 from your perspective. I need to see lockdowns and shutdowns and the political scene and the social scene and all these... Lord, I need your understanding. Because when I try to understand it and make sense, all it does is make me angry. All it does actually, if you're really, if we're really honest, is all it does is take my focus away from Jesus Christ where it belongs onto worldly matters. That for a hundred years from now will not matter. Probably in my life, ten years from now, it won't matter. See, we need to see things. Differently, We desperately need God's perspective on everything. But see, for many people, that is really hard to do. And you know why it's difficult? Because they let too many other things get in the way, like their own opinions and their own thoughts. Again, it ends up being all about what I think and what I want. Dallas Willard, this is profound what he said. Few people arise in the morning as hungry for God as they are for cornflakes or toast and eggs. You understand, if you are ever going to have your eyes open so that you can see things from God's perspective, you must learn consistently to do two key things. One, you have to develop a sensitivity to the Lord and his spirit. Got some news for you. God doesn't typically sort of shout or grab us and shake us to get our attention. Now, sometimes he does. Sometimes he's very severe, very kind of upfront, just kind of gets you. But generally speaking, that's not how he's going to operate. He's given you freedom. He's going to let you exercise your freedom, even if it's... Now, he's going to warn you. He's going to send people to you. He's going to try to help you. But generally speaking, God whispers ever so gently... And that still small voice may be easily overlooked or disregarded if you are not sensitive to God and his spirit. If you keep making it about yourself, your agenda, your thoughts, you're going to miss out on what the spirit is really saying. The good news is that according to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, if you are sensitive to the Lord and you are earnestly seeking him, he promises to be found because he wants to be found. It's just like he wants to open your eyes. So if you are sincerely seeking after him, if you go after him, he says, you'll find me. You got me. You've got to understand, God wants to give us a new perspective. He wants to help us see and understand. But you've got to be sensitive to him. You know, I think of that image like when Doris was here doing her pottery. Soft piece of clay. Wanting to be shaped. Wanting to be molded. You've got to be sort of tender, I think is the word that keeps coming to my mind, and sensitive that, Lord, I love you. I, I trust you. I want, I want to be whatever you want me to be. I want to see striving, know that you're God, and I want to live that way. But see, so you've got to be sensitive to him. But you also have to seek him. Because guess what? If you're not seeking him or if you're not seeking him with all your heart, you're not going to find him. You may grow in your religious knowledge and education, but you will not have this deep, intimate relationship with the living God. The second thing you must consistently learn to do 
This should be no surprise to you what I'm about to say. <laughs> you must be immersed in God's word. That's the only way you can get his perspective and see the world as he does. You know, this is how I sort of picture it. Maybe this will help. The Bible is a lens for seeing the world as God does. I see something happening over here in the political realm or this in relationships or work or whatever it may be. I need to take scripture and I need to look at those events through what God says first rather than my own feelings, my own gut. You know, that's what I need to do. In fact, something John Stott said, and I've shared this with you before, when I'm suffering, when I'm going through hard times, I need to look at all that through the cross. Yeah, people are suffering today. Our Lord suffered. Our Lord constantly said we would suffer. He told us all these things that our people are freaking out today. He told, my son says, oh, praise the Lord. It's getting close now. Because everything he said would happen in this world before he came, it looks like it's lining up. That's a good thing. So I, when I'm suffering, when I'm hurting, I've got to look at my suffering through what Scripture says about my Lord on a cross. That's the only place life's going to make sense. J.I. Packer said, Scripture is quite simply God communicating, God talking, God teaching, God preaching, God telling you about himself. Scripture is where we meet God and gain his perspective on life. Because I'm, I'm taking that in as I'm immersed in that. I'm always amazed how I'm in a situation, suddenly a scripture I've read just pops into my head and I have my answer. Because as those things are coming into my heart, and I'm not just talking this as an academic study or, yeah, I'm checking the box, I read my devotional passage today. No, I'm sitting with it. When I have questions, which I often do, Lord, I don't understand. I mean, I can take the Greek and the Hebrew apart. I can, I can exegete it properly. Lord, I don't know why it's here. I don't know what you're going for. Open my heart. Open my mind to see beyond these grammatical tools and exercises I've learned. I want to know what you were going for here. I want to see it. And see, that's what he does. He opens our eyes and our minds so that we can see, and that enables us to discern the truth. And man, do we need the truth. And he is the truth. But we keep filling ourselves up with things that is our truth. But does it line up with his truth? If not, that's just your opinion. That's just you trying to rebel against God, really. The Bible also reveals God's plan. Not only for the present, but for the future. His plan for the ages. And it's very simple. He started out in Genesis, one in relationship with human beings. And when you get to the end of Revelation, guess what? He's brought everything back together. It's sort of Eden relaunched. And we're back where God always wanted it to be. It's not complicated. He has given us the battle plan. He's given us the story. And the longer we live, we see more and more and more of those things being fulfilled so that we can have confidence in what he says, so that we can know with certainty what's really going on. You know, in a very real sense, the Bible functions as an instruction manual. You need to have this heart, mindset, attitude. You need this perspective. Oh, when you're dealing with this thing over here, yeah, go look at this. Read this. Focus on this. Now, by the way, it won't always be easy for us to see things from God's perspective. In fact, it can be downright difficult. Because, and you know why? You should know by now. If, I, if we're still calling this dependence series, we are now week eight. You should know the answer to this. You know why it's hard to see? Because you first and foremost must know God. Not know about God, not know some verses, know the stories. You must know him personally. Then you must love him. And if you know and love him, you will trust him. You will depend on him and his timing. And let me throw a fifth one in there for you. You must obey his word. Apart from that, it's going to be difficult. And I think that's probably the reason why so many people, even Christians, or so-called Christians, avoid, you know, the truth of Scripture. Well, that was, that was then. 
God doesn't, that was written to a people in ancient times. They did not have the complexity of life we have. Well, doesn't want God to provide for my family? Isn't my children the most important? No, God's been pretty clear since the beginning. You know, he's supposed to be first. See, here's the problem. You start, it's actually, I like what Stott said. He says, the Bible's actually a very dangerous book to read. Because once you start reading and taking it in, you don't really have a, a valid excuse for not doing it. People are like, you mean I can't do that? Or I have to do that? Or this is that? Well, so many, you know, many Christians are functionally illiterate by choice. And I want to encourage you once again to be immersed in God's word. You know, not just to read it. Meditate on it. Sit with a verse or two. Chew on it. Think about it. Lord, what do you want me to know? Talk to me, Lord. Show me. Take it into your heart. Take it into your mind. As you do that, you're going to see life in a brand new way. You're going to see it from God's perspective. Because you see, the Bible can give... Now, I know there are people that are always... Well, I want to learn to do this. What verse do I read? It's taken the whole thing in because the more time you spend with God, like any other relationship, he starts changing you. His word, those principles start becoming, his truth becomes part of you. And so it just starts to, it's the whole, it's sort of a whole life kind of thing. But think about this. The Bible can give us new perspectives on so many important topics. How about, here's a big one. How about relationships? You want to have a good marriage? God spelled it out clear as can be. Plain as can be. You want to have a good relationship with your kids? It tells you. You want your kids? God tells you what your part in raising children is and how to train them up in the way of the Lord. After that, it's on him. He teaches you how we should treat each other, including people we don't like. In his word, he tells us in the clearest of terms how to build healthy relationships. Of course, there's a word that's used and associated with that with a lot of people don't like today. It's called humility. It, you know, one of the things God does, he spends a lot of time teaching us about the importance of our words because in my experience, it's 30 plus years as a counselor. Most relationships struggle because of things somebody have said, things they've said which they shouldn't have. Or they were said, because we all know one another. So you, if you want to hurt somebody, you know exactly what to say to hurt them. So God teaches, Proverbs chapter 15, there's eight verses in there. You follow those, you'll have good, healthy relationships and a great marriage. Because it tells you what you use your words for and what you don't use them for. It teaches us how to pray. I was thinking about this the other day. So many of the prayers I hear, it's really people expressing their will and their desires that they want God to bless. I've, one of my mentors, who wrote a fabulous book about it, spent almost three years meditating just on the six or seven verses of the Lord's Prayer, and never said he reached the end. I started praying that every day for our world. If you understand what you're praying, and you pray that with fervor and passion, you don't need other prayers, really. How does it begin? This is what I pray every day. Hallowed be your name. Lord, I want your name to be revered. I want your name to be magnified. I want, I know someday everybody on this planet is going to bow before Jesus, but before that judgment, Lord, I want this world to revere your name. I pray what Ezekiel says 90 times, that they will know you. And here's a bigger one. Lord, so-and-so in the church is sick, they're suffering. I pray for your presence. I don't know if your will is to heal them or not. So, Lord, would your will be done in that person's life? Would your will be done over here? Would you help us as a church to do your will? That prayer always gets answered. But it's essential. God, Jesus himself, taught us how to pray. He teaches us how to, it teaches us how to deepen our relationship with God. If you're not growing deep in your relationship with God, trust me, you, you know, he's not the problem. <laughs> it tells us how to relate to God, how to approach God, how we treat him, what we need to think and feel. It enables us to understand the importance of loving all people, not just those who are nice or who love us, but even our enemies. You know something? You know what I've been praying for, especially this week? And it's not, I'm not telling you this is easy, but it's what I've been praying. That the Taliban, that ISIS... The dictators in North Korea and China and Turkey and Pakistan and in this country, I pray for their salvation every day. 
And if they're enemies of God and they're going to oppose God and they are not elect, then I pray that he, I pray Psalm 35. If you don't know what that is, look it up. I do not have a right to pray for God to get somebody when I know his heart is to change people. I told you before the, we got shut down from COVID, the guy we were going to bring in used to be Arafat's hit man. He was going to come here and tell you how Christ changed his life and having murdered many people in the name of Islam and this worships Jesus. I don't have a right to decide who or who is going to be saved. But I can pray. I've also found that as God opens my eyes and changes my perspective about other people, especially those who are difficult to love, it is then that I begin not only to understand them, but to see them rightly. There was a person I used to have to deal with in leadership that professed to be a Christian, but I think was one of the meanest, orneriest, most divisive people I have ever known in my life. Always attacking, always doing behind-the-back things, always trying to hurt us, and, and was successful in doing that. And my prayer started out as God get her. But then God convicted me of that and, at, and pretty much told me, you need to pray for me to open your eyes. I want you to see what I see. And when he did that, you know what happened? I broke down and started to cry. Because this mean, divisive person was as broken a person as I've ever seen when God showed me. Once he showed me what was going on in her life and how broken she was, I couldn't hate her or be mad at her anymore. And I think that probably, it, I felt sorry for her. And I think that made her <laughs> angrier at me than anything. But it changed. And nobody in my life I hate. There's nobody I don't want to see go to heaven. Here's a big one. The Bible gives us God's perspective on time. Look at this before. Look at, I, look at Ephesians chapter 5. And as I'm getting older, you know what? Time or the lack of time I have left is becoming a lot more precious to me. But listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. He's been talking about how they're supposed to live the Christian life and they're supposed to imitate God. And he says, therefore, be careful how you walk, you know, how you live, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, what Paul is saying is that as believers, we must be careful with our Christian life and treat it as the important thing that it is. You know, this is the only time we're going to get to serve Christ this way. It's a precious gift. Now, the Greek word exagorazo, which is translated in verse 16, is making. That word, that's very insightful. It literally means to redeem or to buy back. And so the idea is that of buying up every passing opportunity that comes your way. So the person who has gained God's perspective, who sees with his eyes, knows that time is an extremely precious commodity. And they use it as fully and as effectively as they possibly can. Because things happen so fast. Even in my life in the past week, certain things that happen to people in our church, things that happen to my friends, it happens so quick. See, God helps us. He wants us to understand his perspective. And his perspective is, for us human beings, as mortals, time passes really quickly. And the days are evil. So he instructs us, you know, seize every opportunity while it's there. Because see, once time has passed, no one can get it back. I'm teaching a call to ministry class. People are debating whether they're being called right now. Well, here's the thing. There's a time to answer, but the time's going to pass. If people don't respond, it can be too late. There's opportunities, there's situations that arise, and God says, go. And if we don't go, we may miss out. Last week, I was reminded that sometimes we wait too long to say really important things. And we got an email, shocked me, just kind of ruined my week, honestly, that someone dear to me had died, used to attend our church, and uh, they sent an email, and just said, yeah, I just found, and it was Doug, you found your address and my brother's stuff as I was going through it yesterday. He died yesterday. I thought, man, I've always communicated with him a lot, especially through mail, because I love the letters he writes. I've saved every one. Most brilliant man I've ever known in my life. And he was here for a long time. 
even to today, he has strong, he has supported First Baptist Church of San Mateo financially 20 times more than any other family in this church. He continued to do that. Huge gift we got last year, that was him. And I had contacted him not long ago, and I'd sent him a bunch of Russell's books because he's a great travel guy. And I said, hey, when this thing lifts, I want to go down to Columbia and help Russell out. I want you to come with me. Okay, yeah. He'd been taking care of his father. It just blindsided me. Didn't even want to believe it was real. But I wrote a letter to his family because I wanted him to know what he meant to me. I'm sure they knew him. And he wasn't a warm, fuzzy kind of guy. He wasn't unkind. He just, I mean, I remember one time we had him over for dinner. We had a great night. We got ready to leave. Candace threw her arms around him, and I was just like, oh, no, he's never coming back to our house. He just wasn't comfortable with that stuff. But I treasured the time when we spent a lot of time together. And I want him to know he was loved here. And what he meant to me. I shared last time I'd seen him, he gave me three objects that that I would keep forever in his memory. Then it hit me. I never told him how I felt. Now, <laughs> next chance I get is an eternity. Or sometimes we fight over things that just really don't matter that much. So God's words, words teaches us that we need to live as though today, this day is our last day on planet Earth. If we would live that way, we would live so much better. We wouldn't be so caught up in political and social issues. We wouldn't be fighting with people. We wouldn't hold grudges. We wouldn't allow conflicts to escalate. We wouldn't be so full of ourselves. One of the fears I have, I, I don't ever want my wife to leave for work or a trip or anywhere with us in conflict. I do not want the last words we ever speak together to be anything but I love you, I'll see you soon. Sometimes, and I've seen people crippled with that for years. See, the Bible gives us God's perspective on eternity. The whole thing, we have it all. See, God's word teaches us is that there is eternal life, and every human being will live forever. Tells us there is a life to come, and we should never lose sight that beyond our time on this earth lies eternity. That fact alone should cause us to really think and rethink and use the time that God has graciously allotted to each of us more wisely. Lord, it's you. I'm yours. This life is really your life. Where do you want to put me? How do you want to use me? Where do you want to deploy me? I'm yours. Because he, you know, we need to think about how do I invest in eternity in the things that really matter the most. Unfortunately, people today, including many professed Christians, don't have God's perspective on eternity. I know that just based on the emails and things I get about people freaking out right now. And as a result, they are investing themselves. They're getting themselves caught up in things and issues and causes that are not going to last and do not deserve to be our priorities. Let me be very clear with you. If you are not intentional, and focused on God and his word, you will quickly forget what really matters most and you will end up living for this present world instead of the one to come. And I am convinced if we truly understood eternity from God's perspective, it would change our lives individually and as a church. I mean, how can we say that we have God's perspective on eternity? How can we say we understand what's coming and be afraid of the current events? Yes, I grieve over military people that lost their lives this week and people and citizens and all the atrocities going on. I grieve and I pray about those things. But I'm not ready to, to go down in the bunker and hide. I'm not going to live in fear and anxiety and stress about which party's in power and which law gets passed and what's this and what's happened with that next. 
Because scripture tells me not to fear. Fear and faith are incompatible. I cannot be trusting my future and eternity to God and be freaked out and scared by everything else at the same time. It's, it's impossible. So how I'm dealing with issues right now tells me a lot about what I really think about God and my eternal future. How can, if we understand eternity, how can we not be motivated to tell everyone we know about Jesus? We know how the story ends. We know what's going to happen. Are we telling other people? I mean, we put it in different terms. Do you have a sense of urgency regarding sharing the gospel? For that matter, do you even care where people will spend eternity? All people. If you don't, you don't have God's perspective. Don't have his heart. And I could go on for the rest of the day looking at subjects or areas of life in which we desperately need to see things from God's perspective. But suffice it to say, through his word, through his spirit, God wants to open our eyes and help us understand reality as he, the creator, the all-knowing, the all-wise, the all-loving God has defined it. He wants you and I to see the way things really are. Because see, here's the thing. Many of the things that we see that bother us, that trouble us, they're real or they appear to be real. They're not reality. I was reading the other day in the Old Testament about how Israel, you know, Jews under attack from Assyria and they are completely, they've lost every city but Jerusalem. And remember the king sends his messengers, you know, you don't believe in that fake God, he ain't going to save you. And they prayed. They took the letter and they put it before God and they prayed. And it just, it still blows my mind. I read it at least twice a year. It still blows my mind. Blew my mind this week. One angel, God sent one angel that night and he killed 185,000 soldiers. One angel. What looked real and what was reality from God's perspective are not the same things. The other day it occurred to me that almost every area of my life demands that I make choices. So many choices in a day. But here's the thing. If you're going to see with Jesus' eyes, then you must choose to be a spiritual person and live a spiritual way. You've got to want to be his child and live his way for him or it doesn't work. Actually, you are required to bet your life that this visible world, while real, is not reality itself. It's not the last word. That's why you need to learn to depend on God's understanding, not your own. We need to trust God and obey God. I want to leave you with one final thought. It's biblical and it's true. God is not interested in developing your natural state. He wants to develop your supernatural state. He wants to open your eyes so that you can see what he wants you to see and live the way he wants you to live. And, and I truly believe with all of my heart that what the Lord would say to each of, this morning, each of us this morning is, ask me to open your eyes. Ask me to reveal my heart to you so that you, my beloved child, can see as I do. And I would encourage you to do that right now. And all week, once the Lord showed me we were going this direction, there's two songs couldn't get out of my mind. One is, we used to sing all the time from Israel, Houghton, oh, that the church would arise, oh, that we would see with Jesus' eyes. But then the Lord brought a hymn to my mind the other day. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. If that's your prayer from your heart, I just about guarantee that prayer will be answered. Lord, I thank you for being so good, so faithful. Lord, how we need to see from your perspective. Lord, these things that are going on in this world, the things they trouble us, they alarm us, they anger us. And Lord, though they're at least in part real, they're not reality. Lord, help us. Let's pray, pray especially for your church that we would see as you want us to see, that we would let you define reality so that we would be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope to those living in darkness and those all around us that there is a better way, that there is a God who knows us and loves us and cares us. And when we ask him, he carries our burdens. 
that you are there. Lord, one of the greatest opportunities we have to proclaim your excellencies and witness to you right now is to just live a life of confident faithfulness. So Lord, open our eyes, I pray. Help us to be instant and ready for you to use in any way that you choose. And Lord, I just thank you that it is your desire that as we seek you, we will find you. And I praise you in Jesus' name, amen.